All right, finally, look at that. We're back to normal. Tank top, sunglasses, sunshine, outside. Gotta love it. I know I do. Now that we finally had these three crazy days of rain, it's so nice that it's basically over and uh, we can kind of get on with our lives again. <laughs> now, last week I made a video talking about how my expenses went up so much this year when it comes to my monthly because of my higher property taxes, higher HOA dues, things like that. And today I wanna to talk about how these same fees are affecting many different people, not just me, because there was a report about how much people's property taxes went up all throughout the country. So here's something to take a look at because I know a lot of people still wanna buy a home and if you are one of those people, then you need to know what could potentially happen with your property taxes when you do. Now what this report says is property taxes went up twice as fast in 2022 as they did in 2021. And before we jump into any numbers with this, the simple reason for that is because of all the appreciation with real estate. And by the way, this affects people who already own a home too, However, many states have a homestead exemption, and if you do have something like that, usually that can help you save money on your taxes and you won't get hit with nearly as much of an increase as someone who, say, doesn't have one. But just know that because you already own a home doesn't exempt you from having a property tax increase. Now, all of this property tax data is according to the research firm Adam, and what they're saying, on average, people in Florida paid less than $4,100 a year on property taxes in 2022, which is not even half of what the typical resident pays in New Jersey. Many areas in New Jersey, like in Essex and Bergen counties, the average homeowner there is paying about $13,000 a year in property taxes. Now, if we see any of these houses on the walk for sale, I'll show you what their property taxes are, and I guarantee you they're probably higher than that but it's because also property taxes are based on how much the home is worth and how much somebody recently paid for it as well. But here's the thing, we had a ton of migration, a bunch of people moving into the Southern United States during the pandemic where property taxes were traditionally pretty low. And now that so many people have moved in, the property taxes have been starting to jump in these areas because they just don't have the infrastructure, at least that's their excuse, for all these new residents. So they need the money for you know, making better roads and bridges and whatever, right? If, if that's what you want to believe, if that's what they really use the money for. <laughs> so here's the nationwide figures when it comes to property taxes. The average tax on single family homes increased 3% in 2022 to $3,900 a year after rising 1.8% the previous year. That's why they're saying that property taxes went up twice as fast in 2022 as they did in 2021. But here's the interesting thing from all of this. Apparently, 19 of the 20 cities that Adam tracks that have the highest property taxes are actually in the Northeast and the Midwest. Like I told people before, if you're gonna move down here to Florida or the South or whatever, to save money on taxes that could make sense for some people but you got to remember all the other taxes and fees that are involved with everything you have property taxes maybe they'll be less than new york or illinois or indiana and we don't have state income tax here in florida anyways but you can't really rely on having a low property tax bill if you're going to buy a somewhat expensive home because that home will get reassessed when you buy the property and when that happens, the following year, your property tax bill is going to go up. And I think this is probably one of the number one expenses along with if you're buying in an HOA, HOA fees or assessments, as well as unexpected repairs that home buyers don't factor in when they're gonna buy a new place. And like I shared with you guys, fees can go up considerably basically overnight, guys. I mean, I've only owned my condo for a year, a little over a year and the fees are up 1500 bucks. Well, I knew the property taxes were gonna go up. That was a given, I knew that already, and I kind of already calculated it in advance. And I also knew there would be a special assessment, but what I didn't know 
is that the HOA dues would go up as much as they did, mainly because of higher insurance rates and utilities. So these are all things that you have to take into consideration when you're buying a home, guys. Too many people just look at the price tag, they look at the current monthly payment based on the mortgage calculator and say, oh yeah, I can afford that. But there's more to it than that. Because think about this, a lot of people buy and think that's gonna be my monthly budget and they form the rest of their household budget around that payment, right? But what happens when that payment goes up five, $600, $1,000 or more unexpectedly? if you don't think about these things. Will you still be able to afford your home? What else are you gonna to have to cut back on in order to still afford things? So you need to know how much it's gonna go up by in the future and you can calculate this yourself. What you need to do is look up the percentage of property taxes in your county, estimate based on your new purchase price what your new property tax bill is gonna be. And likely your estimate is gonna be higher than what the bill will actually be based on that because that's not how the county actually makes the bill. They make the bill based on what's called millage rates. Now this house is a great example for us to take a look at for this video. The house is for rent. They've been trying to rent it since the end of last year for $11,000 a month. No tenant so far, lowered the price to 9,400 and still no takers. And if you look before, the last time it rented in 2019 was for $4,000 a month. So it should be rented for significantly less than the $9,000 they're asking. But here's the real kicker, guys. Look at this property tax bill. And I had to dig through my MLS to find this. This wasn't available readily on Zillow or anything like that. But look at this, when they bought this house, the property tax bill basically doubled. Why? Because the assessed value went from 813,000 to 1,000,000.666,000, which is a little bit less than what they paid for it at 1.9 million. So that puts their property tax bill at roughly $2,750 per month. And mind you, this is a waterfront house, so the, the expenses that come with this are probably astronomical. The insurance on this has to be crazy, definitely need to have flood insurance if they didn't pay cash. On top of that, the utilities and everything else, they probably need to rent this house for like $7,000 a month or more just to break even, I would imagine. So let's say the current owner of the house you're looking at buying is paying $4,000 a year in property taxes, okay? You're gonna buy the home for 500,000. Well, if your local county has a 2% property tax rate, then what's 2% of 500,000? That's $10,000 a year, guys. So if you think that it's gonna remain at 4,000 after you buy the $500,000 home, it's not going to. It's gonna be very close to that $10,000 mark unless your county has some sort of homestead exemption, something like that, so it might be a little bit lower, but it's still gonna be considerably higher than what the current person is paying. And here's something a lot of people don't know, is that when you go to qualify for a mortgage, for example, and they figure out if you can afford the property, they're using the current number. So they're using that $4,000 a year to qualify you for the property even though it's set to basically double by the time you own the place for a year. So this is a big thing that you need to keep in consideration when buying a property. Because if your property taxes go up $6,000 the following year, that's an extra $500 a month on top of the payment that your mortgage company's currently quoting you. And that doesn't include any HOA fees if there are any, and it doesn't include any surprise repairs that your home may need doesn't include any of that stuff. If they're telling you that your payment's gonna be, you know, $2,600 a month, you better plan on it being more like $3,300 a month in about a year from now. And if you're not planning on that, then you can be in big trouble. It's basically the point we're trying to make here. Now you guys want another sign that the real estate industry is in trouble? I saw an article today from the Florida Realtors telling real estate agents that, hey, maybe you should think about adding property management services to your roster of services when the market's slow. Because this is good to have whether the market's hot or not because it gives you an extra source of clients, you know, you're renting to people and dealing with more people on a regular basis and eventually some of those people turn into buyers, right? So in order to become a property manager, you have to get an additional license from the state 
and get your property management license. You know what my real estate school teacher used to say when I was in real estate school? He used to say, if you want guaranteed headaches, then get yourself into property management because that's a surefire way to have them because you're going to be dealing with all kinds of problems every single day as if being a real estate agent is already not tough enough. This is a great way to just kill yourself, guys, because, you know, being a property manager and a real estate agent at the same time, to me, sounds like a complete nightmare. Some people have the personality for it and can handle it. I, for one, am not one of those people. But the real problem here is that home sales are down 22% from just one year ago and even more than that if you go back a little bit further. Real estate agents are not making the type of money that they used to and that's why you see so many people quitting and leaving the business right now. Not out of, not out of choice, but out of necessity. But yet, you have all these articles talking about how the market's great and everything's in recovery mode now. You know, the pending sales are ticking back up just like all the stuff we just talked about the other day. And uh, you know, it's all coming back, guys. Have no fear, the experts say it's coming back. One of my channel members, Nick, sent me this story about how car breakdowns are making more people fall behind on their car payments. And the reason for this is because people are driving cars longer and longer to the point where these are cars that probably shouldn't even be on the road anymore. Half of them should be in the junkyard. And we already know that the pandemic made car prices more expensive, even used cars as well. And the downside from this is that now more lenders don't want to give loans on used cars, especially older ones, because of the risk of people defaulting on these cars because they break down and then they can't afford to fix them and then they stop paying. So it's a big risk for the lender to do this. Here's a story about a lady from this article saying that she had a 2013 BMW, okay? She bought the car and within six months, the car broke down. She took it to the dealership. They said, you need a brand new engine, which would cost about $19,000 to replace. And so what happened is this woman started missing shifts at work because the car was broke down, couldn't get to work. She got fired from her job. She's not making payments on the car anymore. And now they're probably gonna repossess the car. Just one hiccup away, guys from financial disaster, like I'm always telling you. This is a great example of that right here. How somebody, all they had to happen was a car breakdown and that's it. No job, no more car, no more anything because of this. And check out this chart right here showing how much the used car repairs have gone up in recent years. The used car repairs are the dark blue line. You can see how much it has skyrocketed of how much people need to bring their old used car into the shop. And you know, people are paying these huge car payments these days. There's a lot of people with $1,000 a month plus car payments. And then say, you got the fuel pump that goes out, that's $2,000 to fix. And you gotta decide, well, that's two months of my car payment. Do I fix the car and uh, deal with more repairs like this in the future or just let the whole thing go? And sadly, that's what people are facing right now. And as if that's not all bad enough, of course, the cost to fix a car is also going up due to inflation. In fact, car repair prices have gone up 12.5% from just a year ago. This is the highest jump in car repair prices in just one year since 1975, guys. So we talk about all these statistics about how this hasn't happened since the last recession. How about since 1975? And it says before the pandemic, people spent on average about $600 a year on car maintenance and repairs and now it's about $800 a year which is still pretty cheap if you ask me because one one expensive repair like we talked about can be way over 800 bucks and here's how we know this is a growing problem as well if we look at this chart it shows the amount of vehicle registrations by age and you see the new vehicle registrations are plummeting compared to vehicles that are much older that are between 8 and 11 years old are skyrocketing and when you buy a car this old who knows what type of trouble it can have. So a lot of car repair shops are reporting that their customers are coming in and saying, just do the bare minimum to get this thing running again because they can't afford, you know, what really needs to be done to fix the car. And obviously, when you just use a Band-Aid solution to fix a car, it's gonna break down again and you're eventually gonna be facing the same problem, which kind of sounds synonymous with what our government is doing these days. They just keep trying to Band-Aid all of our problems rather than fix them from the core 
and as you can see they keep bubbling up bigger and bigger because they were never fixed so it's basically been determined now that if somebody buys a car a used car and it breaks down shortly after they buy it then the chances of them defaulting on the loan skyrocket and what happens after that is the car gets repossessed the lender either needs to sell that car to try to recoup their losses or sometimes they'll even slap the borrower with a difference like say you know that the, the person still owes 10 grand on the car they were only able to get eight for it at auction they'll send you a bill in the mail for two grand saying hey you still owe us money and if you don't pay It'll go to collections and hurt your credit, of course. So this auto lending company, Southern Hills, that's what they're starting to do. They're starting to charge the borrowers the difference between what they can get for it at auction and what they actually owe on the loan. Kind of like when you have to short sale a house, the only difference with that is instead of getting the bill, you get a tax bill saying that, hey, you sold the house for far less than what you owed on the loan. This is gonna be treated as income on your next tax return. You have to pay taxes on this money. And Southern Hills has been reporting that they have about 4,000 accounts that have $40 million in outstanding loans in the southwestern United States. This is about double of what they used to see in the past. And the used car prices are getting ridiculous, guys. The average used car price right now is $28,000. I mean, how much did you pay for your first car? I know a lot of you are probably older than me and it was probably like 600 bucks or something. Me personally, I had, my first car was a Pontiac Grand Am and I paid about 7000 for it and that seemed like it was expensive back then. But nowadays getting a car like that would feel like a steal because I remember the car only had like you know 19,000 miles on it something like that maybe 23,000. It was an excellent car. I never had any issues with it and the only reason I still don't have it is because it got totaled in an accident. So it was really sad to see that car get destroyed because it was such a reliable car. It was great on gas, it was only a four cylinder engine, easy to work on, you know, you could pretty much fix almost anything you wanted to yourself on a car like that. But nowadays, according to Edmunds.com, a three year old car is selling for about $30,000 and nine year old cars are still selling for $16,000, which is insane to spend $16,000 on a nine year old car, guys. I mean, I you know some people are like big proponents of buying used cars and trying to get a deal, but what you're saving on the front end with the purchase, you're surely likely to pay on the back end in the form of repairs and breakdowns. And the thing I always hated about, you know, the repairs on cars is not just the bill, but being stuck unexpectedly. There's nothing worse than when you have an appointment or you have to be somewhere and your car just wham breaks down unexpectedly and now you can't get there anymore just like this woman that lost her job over this you know it can really mess up your life if you kill if you don't have reliable transportation and we know a lot of these cars shouldn't be on the road because in 2021 12 million cars made it to the junkyard and in 2020 that number was 16 million so the amount of cars that are going into the junkyard is less and you might say oh that's great for the environment or whatever but what it really means is people are trying to stretch these vehicles to their dying breath and they're actually paying for it in more ways than one as we just discussed and guys to me this is just another sign of the recession okay people can't pay for their broke down used car and they have to get let it get repossessed that that's ruins your life similarly to a foreclosure you know it puts a huge ding on your credit you don't have a car no more how do you get to work how do you even get another car now that your credit is dinged like now you're going to be stuck with those buy here pay here places that will totally you know annihilate you when it comes to the interest payments and fees they have over there so one step one hiccup away from financial ruin is all it takes with situations like this now one last thing is that one of the main reasons it can still feel like a seller's market in a lot of areas i know people write me all the time saying that you know it's very competitive here you know homes are still flying off the shelf is inventory guys we've already talked about that but the amount of new listings that have come on the market during the first week of april is down almost 22 percent year over year which is pretty low when you're talking about the spring home selling season here's the interesting thing from this it turns out that these higher interest rates are actually deterring sellers more than they're deterring buyers which is a really interesting and unique way to look at this because obviously buyers have to pay the higher interest rates when they buy a home right well so do sellers if they want to sell their home and buy another one and so many would-be sellers right now have 
interest rates that are below what they're currently offering. Because the reality is, if you have a listing that's priced properly and it's in a good area, it's gonna sell fast under this environment still. We're seeing it all the time. I even see it here in Miami. I think I showed a listing maybe a week or two ago showing how it flew off the market in just two weeks, which is not very typical for this area considering how expensive the homes are, but it was priced properly and therefore it went quickly. And you know that the Midwest is still doing pretty strong also because it's so affordable over there. And guess what? You guys are actually leading the way in terms of home price increases, guys. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home prices there are up 11.4% year over year and Fort Lauderdale is right behind it at 8.9%. And then you got West Palm Beach and Miami and Columbus, Ohio. These are all the places that have seen the biggest year over year price gains in the last year. And as you can see, most of them are here in Florida, but you still have Ohio, Columbus, and you have Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the Midwest. But we know that that's not the case everywhere. In fact, if you look at Austin, Texas, okay, they're going down by 14.7% year over year. Sacramento's down 11.7%. Oakland, California's down 10.4%. San Jose's down 10.2%. Seattle's down 9.6%. So yeah, not everywhere is experiencing the same thing right now. So depending on where you live, it can feel like a buyer's market or it can feel like a seller's market. But my one warning for you is that if you're in an area that still feels like a seller's market, like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for example, just be careful because just because prices are still going up, just like they are still here in Miami in some cases, doesn't mean that you should be out there offering over asking price and trying to get a home like that and waiving contingencies, guys. You can do whatever you want. And if your agent advises you to do that, that's your choice. But I think you're setting yourself up for trouble considering all the things we're facing right now. Because before you do that, just remember the banking crisis is not even over. The recession has barely begun. Layoffs are ramping up all over the place. So before you just jump in there and do something crazy, just think about all this and make a level-headed decision. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't wanna wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one.